Hello, and welcome to another Portland Cocktail Week distance learning class. All right, guys, I don't want you, get to, you, get, you to get too excited, but today we have an amazing, amazing show. We have, I, I mean, he's the master distiller of the year. Let's start there, right? We have Brent Elliott from Four Roses with us. And not only is Brent gonna talk about the amazing whiskeys that Four Roses makes, but he's gonna dive into all of the science behind the amazing bourbon. Um, so I'm really excited for this. We also have with us Jill Pendigraf, who is the Director of Marketing at Four Roses, who's been working really closely with Brent on all of the really great anti-waste solutions that Four Roses has come up with over the, the past, oh my goodness, their whole existence. Because uh, you'll learn a little bit through the presentation, uh, but bourbon is made in a very ethical, very green, very environmentally friendly way. And not only that, but Four Roses built on top of what was already a well-made, beautifully made and ethically sourced product and made it even greener. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear all about what they've been up to and dig into all of this incredible science. But before we do that, I want to stop and I want to tell you about two things that are happening right now. We've got a quiz that I'm positive in the links, <laughs> is linked in the comments right now. Um, and that quiz does two things for you. One, the first hundred people to sign up and fill out that quiz are gonna get their hands on one of those amazing Portland Cocktail Week hoodies that the incredibly talented and wonderful friend, uh, Jen Hagstrom has put together every year for Portland Cocktail Week. I know these things are a hot ticket, so you better get in there and get that quiz filled out right now. Um, it's, it's definitely gonna go fast. <laughs> uh, we, we know that they always do. The other thing that the quiz gets you, which I'm really excited about, you're not only gonna be eligible for that hoodie, but 25 people with the highest scores, highest essay question scores, are gonna get their hands on some Four Roses bourbon and this incredible Four Roses gift pack. Um, if you click through to the link on the quiz, you'll see all of the goodies that we're gonna send your way. I'm not gonna spoil the surprise too much, uh, but it's all over there on that link, pdxcw.com slash Four Roses. So get over there as soon as this class is done. You're definitely gonna need the info from this class to score well on the quiz. So pay attention take notes, maybe open the quiz up, take a little peek so you can take notes that, that will be helpful to you later um, and get that quiz in as soon as you can because I want you to have one of these hoodies. They're awesome. Uh, there's also a picture of the hoodies over on that quiz link. So a lot of info over there. Okay, I've bored you enough with the details. Now it's time for the good stuff. Uh, Brent, Jill, please take it away. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, okay, well, we'll just dive right in. You can see here that the uh, presentation, everything I'm going to talk about today is going to be about the process of making bourbon and kind of explain why we do a lot of the things we do, um, what makes bourbon bourbon, the scientific reasons behind why the certain guidelines are in place um, to call whiskey bourbon. And um, But first, I'm going to go ahead and give you just a little bit of history and background on Four Roses. Uh, so and that's part of part of what we do, part of our uniqueness, and I think you can appreciate that too. Um, but first, I want to talk about how important uh, straight bourbon whiskey is to uh, Kentucky. Here's some bourbon facts. It is America's only native spirit. Uh, Kentucky is a birthplace of bourbon. We uh, don't produce all of the world's bourbon. But we like to think we produce the best, and we do produce about 95% of the world's supply. Um, you can read here, it's an $8.5 billion signature industry here in Kentucky, generating a lot of jobs, 17,500 jobs with an annual payroll of $800 million. Um, a lot of capital projects have been underway. You're all probably aware that there's been quite a bourbon boom in the last decade or so. And all of us here in Kentucky are, are rising up to meet that demand with um, expansion projects. And we're no exception. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the production has increased more than 275% since 1999, and with that, we have a lot of barrels aging. We actually have almost two barrels aging for every person in the state of Kentucky, so it's quite a, a phenomenal fact. And the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, which is part of the Kentucky Distillers Association, um, we host over a million visitors per year, I would say, you know, excluding this year, but uh, in a typical year, we're up over a million visitors and 70 percent of those are from out of state so that's just to give you some perspective just how much bourbon has grown and how important it is to the commonwealth of kentucky okay, next slide please 
Okay, this is something I, I tend to glaze over because um, I kind of assume everyone knows the name of Foros, but a lot of times I'll get to the end of the presentation and when the questions come out, someone will ask, why is uh, Four Roses named Four Roses? But it actually goes back to the legend of Four Roses. It's uh, our founder, Paul Jones Jr. When um, Before he created the brand, he was uh, smitten by a lovely Southern belle and he sent a proposal to her, proposal of marriage. And she said if her answer were yes, she would wear a corsage of Four Red Roses to the upcoming Grand Ball. And fortunately for us, she did. And so we've been known as Four Roses ever since. Okay, next. Okay, in the history of Four Roses, the name, the brand was actually trademarked in 1888. And at that time, um, our founder had recently moved from Atlanta, where he started his whiskey business, to Louisville, Kentucky. And he continued selling and producing bourbon up to and actually selling through Prohibition. His company was one of six that was um, allowed to have a medicinal <laughs> license for, um, for selling whiskey during Prohibition. Um, it's pretty interesting to think that it really was considered by not all, but by many people, um, by the enlightened people, they understood that it was there were medicinal values in, in whiskey. So it was permitted for sale during prohibition, which there is were a great lot of for, sick people, a lot of sick people during that time. There were. Yeah. <laughs> and we were there to support them. So um, but that was interesting because prior to prohibition, there were so many different brands, so many distilleries not just in Kentucky, but all over the country. And it was fortunate for us because a lot of these brands were just lost to history. And most all of these distilleries were mothballed and just just uh, closed down. But because we were being sold for medicinal purposes, we never really left the public's consciousness. So shortly after Prohibition, we became one of the top selling bourbons in the United States. And then in 1943, the Canadian company Seagram's, they purchased the brand. And from there, they really um, elevated the status and the uh, the volumes that we sold in the U.S., which was phenomenal, except then they did something pretty interesting. In the late 50s, they took Four Roses as a bourbon off the U.S. market, and they made it export only. So from the late 50s up until 2001, you could get Four Roses bourbon, but you had to go to Europe or Japan to get it. If you wanted Four Roses in the U.S., you could still get a whiskey with four roses on the label, but it wasn't a straight bourbon whiskey. It was a blended whiskey, which uh, we all know is much lighter. It doesn't have the character. It doesn't have the heritage. It's, it's not straight bourbon whiskey. So that was really detrimental to the brand um, through the years, you know, following that transition, the quality, the popularity, the shelf placement, the sales, they all declined dramatically up until the uh, until 2001, 2002, when we brought Four Roses Bourbon back to the U.S. And that was actually a move made by um, Kieran Brewery, who came in and purchased the brand from Seagram's in uh, the early 2000s. Next slide. Now, I wish uh, we could all be here to I could show you around the distillery, but this is the next best thing. This is um, an external shot of our historic Spanish mission style distillery, which was built in 1910. We still don't understand why they chose this design, but we love it. And um, if you've been to Four Roses, you've recognized that every building on the grounds is in the same style. So everything that we do is still under this uh, Spanish mission style motif. Next, please. Okay, and all of these uh, guidelines that have to be followed to uh, call a whiskey bourbon. These are all very important. Some of these are really based in science. And so I'll focus, I'll explain these a little bit now and go a little bit more in depth as I'm going through the presentation. But um, the first one is it has to be made with 51% corn. Now that's not really so scientific. That's really just because that's what was made with originally that uh, the sweetness of the corn, the corn flavor really imparts the signature flavor that makes bourbon bourbon. Uh, the next one, this is very important. It has to be aged in new charred oak barrels. And there's a lot of science behind that because if you try to use a barrel twice, you're not going to get the same results. The extracts, which is a big part of what happens aging in the barrel or the extracts you get from the barrel, those will be depleted. So second time around, you're not going to get the color, the sweetness, the caramels, the vanillas. You're not going to get a lot of those flavors that you get with the new barrel. The next is it has to be distilled at less than 160 proof. 
And that's very important because through fermentation, we generate a lot of flavors. And when these flavors in the beer go over and they're being distilled or concentrated into the white dog, what we want is a good amount and the right amount, the right balance of those flavor compounds to carry over into that white dog. If we distill it too high of a proof, like you would do if you're making light whiskey or vodka or grain neutral spirits, the higher in proof you go, the more you're cutting out all those other compounds, all those other flavors that really help to create that flavor profile that is straight bourbon whiskey. The next is it has to be aged in the barrel at less than 125 proof. And that's very important too, um, especially from a, from a financial standpoint, it makes no sense because in our example, we're aging our barrels at 120 proof or 60% alcohol. So for every barrel, about 40% of that volume is water and barrels aren't cheap. So financially speaking, it would be a lot smarter to come off the still at 160 proof or as high as you could if that weren't a guideline and put it in the barrel and then add the water after the aging. But we know, and it's all based in science, that if you age at a high proof, you don't get the same result at the end of maturation. And that's because you need a certain proportion of water in that, in that spirit to get the right extracts and the right reactions that make straight bourbon whiskey. The next is you can't adulterate it, uh, the flavor or the color in any way. It has to be aged a minimum of two years to be called straight bourbon whiskey. You can age it um, between two and four years, and it's still straight bourbon whiskey. But if it's under four years, you have to state the age somewhere on the label. And the last uh, stipulation is it has to be made in the USA. There's really nothing scientific about that, but uh, you know it's it's our spirit, and we want to keep it that way. Next slide, please. And there are a lot of historical reasons why um, why straight bourbon whiskey has really evolved in Kentucky, but a lot of that is also based on, um, on scientific reasons. And these all relate to the weather and the water. When we're aging in a barrel, it's very important to have very hot summers and very cold winters because of the way the, um, the liquid ages in the barrel. Temperature is probably the most important factor in that aging cycle. And here in Kentucky, we get a lot of rainfall. And as you'll see, there's a lot of water that goes into the bourbon making process. So it's very important that we have a lot of clean limestone rich water to produce Four Roses straight bourbon whiskey. Next. Because the whole process, of course, it's all about the ingredients. If you don't put good ingredients in and take care from the very beginning, you can't expect to have a good product at the end of either distillation, fermentation, maturation, all the way to the bottle. So it all begins with, for us, with yeast propagation. And this all begins in the laboratory. We have five proprietary yeast strains, which I will get into here in a bit, but it all starts out in the lab. We grow up the, the slants or grow up the yeast from a slant in small flasks. And we step up that, that propagation process twice in the laboratory from a small flask to a medium sized flask. And then we transfer it to the distillery. And there's a lot of care taken to uh, maintain the sterility of the environment um, because in making bourbon whiskey, bacteria is always, or, or wild yeast, uh, yeast that we're not, um, we don't want in the fermentation can always change the flavor profile or you know, to some degree spoil the fermentation, which would ultimately uh, show up in the distillate. Next slide, please. So the yeast propagating process is very similar to our main mashing and, and fermentation process, but it's going in, in parallel. So it's sort of a smaller version of it. So whether we are propagating yeast in the yeast masher and trying to ferment it to be ready to inoculate the big fermenters, or we're looking at the big system, it's a very similar process. It all starts with the grains. We have our three grains, the corn, the rye, and the malted barley. And after being milled to the consistency of almost like cornmeal or even fine or almost a powder, um, from that step, we introduce it into the cooker. And cooking is very important for a few reasons. The, the main one is 
in its in its form as it is, corn, rye, and malted barley are composed mainly of starch, which is great, except that yeast cannot consume starch. So there's a little step that we have to to go through, and we call it conversion. It's it's part of the cooking process, and it's where we utilize the enzymes that are indigenous to the malted barley to break down the starch that you'll find in the other grains. So in the cooking process, we start out, we fill it with water, a little bit of back set, which is sour mash, which I'll talk more about in a minute, and a little bit of pre-malt. So we put a little bit of the barley in at the very first stage, and then we add the corn. At that point, we cook it for a period of time. And while we're doing that, a few things are happening. That bit of pre-malt that we've added starts to go in and break the enzymes in the malt, start to break down the starch in the sugar into smaller molecules, into fermentable sugars. Because really what starch is, starch is just a long molecule that's made up of a bunch of simple sugars that are attached to each other. So it's just a long chain of these molecules. The, what the enzymes are doing, they're breaking those down into their smaller subunits so that in subsequent steps, the yeast will have that sugar available to consume to create the alcohol and the, uh, the congeners. So after the uh, corn is cooked, we drop the temperature. And the reason we do that is the next step is adding the rye. And at a high temperature, we can sort of destroy some of the delicate flavors of the rye. So we wanna drop the temperature before we add it. Once we drop the temperature, we add the rye, we cook it for another period of time. Then we drop the temperature yet again, and that's when we add the remainder of the malted barley. At that stage, we continue the cook. That conversion continues. And I didn't mention also that in that cooking process at those elevated temperatures, we're also gelatinizing or um, opening up those starches because when they're all bound tightly together, the enzymes can't really get in to, to cleave all those bonds. So once it's it's uh, hydrolyzed and once all the water gets in there and at the high temperatures, those starches kind of unfold. And that leaves all of those molecules available for that enzyme to go in and and break down those those bonds. Next slide. So the next step after the after the conversion, after the mashing, is we send it to a fermenter. Well, actually, we cool it down. We cool every mash down to 67 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we add it to a, the fermenter, and then we will inoculate it with one of five different yeast strains. And this is something that we're very proud of that we do, and it's part of our uniqueness. We actually have two different mash bills or grain recipes and five different yeast strains that we utilize. And by doing this, we create 10 different recipes. And you can see here, it's a four letter code for each recipe. We have OBSV, OBSK, and so on. And what those mean, it's a four letter code. The first letter indicates Old Prentice. And that was the original name of the Four Roses Distillery. It doesn't mean much today because every bit of Four Roses bourbon that is made anywhere comes from Lawrenceburg, Kentucky at our distillery, which was originally Old Prentice. But back, um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, when Seagram's had multiple distilleries around uh, Kentucky, each distiller was producing straight bourbon whiskey for Four Roses and other Seagram's products. So at that time, it was necessary to designate on the code that was stamped on the barrel and kept in all the uh, inventory documentation to keep a record of which distillery it came from. The second letter is the mash bill. The B is our high rye mash bill, which is 60% corn. 35% rye, 5% malted barley. The E mash bill is 75% corn, 20% rye, and 5% malted barley. And those of you who are familiar with different mash bills used throughout the industry can see immediately that both of these are high in rye. The 35% rye is extremely high in rye. It's one of the highest mash bills of any major distillery that you'll find. Uh, the third letter is straight bourbon whiskey. Again, that's a throwback to the Seagram's days when the different distillers could be producing different kinds of spirits, but now all we produce is straight bourbon whiskey, and that's what the S stands for. So it's, there's always an S in this code. And the last letter is that designates the yeast code. Our yeast codes are V, which creates a delicate fruity flavor through fermentation, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, the K, which creates slight spice. The O, which is very rich and fruity. The Q, which creates floral flavors and aromas. And the F, which is herbal and sometimes minty. Okay, next slide. 
And here is a view of some of our, our fermenters. We have a combination of red cypress, Douglas fir, and stainless steel fermenters. Uh, the red cypress were originally um, installed in the early 90s, but they're starting to wear out. You know, that's the one downside of wooden fermenters is um, that over time they start to fall apart. So we're gradually replacing each one of those with Douglas fir. And it's interesting to note that even in the early 90s, when we had these fermenters built, um, you know, red cypress is kind of hard to find. And it's, it's difficult to, to log and it's not, um, it's not, well, what we did is we actually dredged a swamp in Florida and basically took old lumber that was at the bottom of the Suwannee River and used that lumber to build all these fermenters. But as we replaced these, we replaced the wooden fermenters with Douglas fir. And what's important about fermenters is much different from oak, the wood that we want to use for these are not as porous. They don't have sap channels. They impart no flavor whatsoever. They're very inert because what we're looking for here is just a vessel to hold the liquid during fermentation and nothing more. Brent, is there a difference between um, fermenting in the stainless versus the wooden fermenters? Uh, there's no difference in quality. Uh, if there are any differences, the most obvious one is the wood is a little more difficult to clean. Um, but we go to lengths to ensure that every fermenter between each each uh, fermentation is steamed and sprayed out and thoroughly cleaned so that there isn't any residual um, yeast or bacteria in the fermenter. And there is the one benefit um, besides that they they look more classic and I just like the looks of the wooden fermenters. Um, they do insulate a little better, which isn't really an issue in our facility because um, it's all enclosed and the temperatures don't fluctuate too dramatically. But if you did have severe swings in the exterior temperature, the wood would be a little bit um, preferable just because it would insulate the heat a little bit more. Okay, next slide. So during fermentation, and a lot of times you, know, you hear it's all about the distillation and the aging, but on the front end, the fermentation is so important um, because that is really where a good portion of what I would say the defining flavors are produced. Because if you look at you know Four Roses versus any other distillery, there are there are some differences in distillation practices. There are differences. In ingredients, there are differences in aging conditions, but the difference you taste between one brand and the next, a good portion of that goes back to the fermentation and the different flavors that are created in the very first steps of bourbon production. And especially with us, we um, really focus a lot on this side of it because with the different yeast strains, um, the yeast strains are creating those flavors through the fermentation in, in the, the uh, conditions that we create. And so we put a lot of focus on the fermentation. And so, as I mentioned, you know, ethanol is the primary byproduct of fermentation. And that's why you're going to find um, yeast used in, in any kind of production for any alcoholic beverage. Um, but the other, the other compounds and the other byproducts that are also very important are, um, of course, you have heat, you have carbon dioxide. Then you have this other family of compounds that we refer to as congeners. And these congeners are what are responsible for all the different flavors from one recipe of ours to the next or um, one expression of ours to the next or our whiskey compared to someone else's. It's all these other organic acids, fusel oils, aldehydes, esters, and all these other compounds that even though they're in there at a very small percentage, they really have a big impact on the overall flavor. So if you're looking at our five yeast strains, each one of those has been isolated through the years because of the different um, ratios or the different congeners that they produce. Um, a good example of that would be like our Q yeast strain, which is very floral. If um, you take that, and I have done this, I've, I've taken it and analyzed it on a GC mass spec to look at all the different compounds that are are present in the, the new maker, the, the white dog, as it comes off the still. And you can look and see literally dozens or hundreds of different compounds. And every 
every batch or every recipe will have a different fingerprint of these different compounds that are present in that in that white dog. And for example, with the Q, I remember when I first started Four Roses, and that's actually how I got started Four Roses. My my background is chemistry, and they hired me to run this GC mass spec, this instrument um, to do chemical analysis for export analysis and for um, for export certificates. I'm sorry, and for um, to test chill filtration to make sure it was running up efficiently and properly. But I had some free time, so I would take some of these different recipes and analyze them just to kind of get the fingerprint of the different compounds between one yeast strain and the next. And probably the most interesting thing that I saw when doing that was that the Q yeast strain had an extremely large amount compared to the other um, the other yeast strains of phenyl ethyl alcohol or phenyl ethyl acetate, which coincidentally is rose oil. So I thought that was pretty interesting that, you know, something we always knew, we always knew that the QE strain was floral. We, you know, I learned that my first week on the job and I, I saw it firsthand when I first started smelling and tasting either the uh, distillate or the aged OBSQ or OESQ. But it was really a kind of a fascinating moment to analyze it and confirm that with you know, solid scientific um, data. Yeah. But that's true for for all the compounds. The and if you look at all the compounds that create the flavors, whether it's like isoamyl acetate, which is a banana flavor, you know that's in there. It's in most whiskeys. That's a common conjuner that that comes out through fermentation, or these amyl alcohols, or these esters, ethyl acetate. There are all these different compounds that it's very interesting because with these compounds that we call fruity or spicy or floral. There, there are only a handful of these um, very prevalent um, compounds in nature. And these are the same ones that you find in fruits and spice. It's, it is the exact same compounds. So it's when you're saying that maybe you smell some banana in a whiskey or a Hefeweizen beer, or whatever it might be, that is because it's the same compound that makes a banana smell like a banana. Um, so... You had keep scrolling through that one. Okay, so again, here is just another visual of our five different yeast strains. Okay, next slide, please. So at the end of fermentation, which typically takes um, between 80, sometimes 84 hours, basically we monitor the entire fermentation process. We look at the sugars, the acids, the pH, and the temperature from the beginning of the fermentation all the way to the end. And by tracking all of that data, we know when that fermentation is complete. And when that fermentation is complete, and well, something else happens too. At the beginning, we set it at 67 degrees Fahrenheit. And then all of the yeast starts to metabolize, starts to consume the sugars, it starts to create energy and heat and alcohol and congeners. And as it does this, the temperature rises in the beer. And once the temperature rises 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which usually happens within 48 hours, we intentionally turn on a, a chilled water system. There's a, a coil inside each fermenter that we start up, and that's to maintain that temperature at 90 degrees through the remainder of fermentation. And if we didn't do that, at elevated temperatures, the yeast would start to be stressed. They would start to create off flavors. The yield would start to drop, and we wouldn't be creating good beer for distillation. But by holding it at 90, um, finishing up the fermentation at about 84 hours, we're ready for distillation. And the distillation is super important, too, because all those compounds that, uh, that come through in fermentation, you know, I always focus on the good ones, um, you know, the, the spice, the fruit, the floral, the, all of those positive characteristics. But you also get a lot of other congeners, these somewhat greasy or oily or not really that pleasant, you know, those, those flavors. And you hear a lot about these when talking about batch distillation. When you talk about, you know, there, you have the heads, you have the tails, and you have the hearts of a distillation. And essentially, what the reason you have those categories is because the heads, the stuff that comes off the still in a batch distillation at the very beginning it's typically not good. The stuff that comes off towards the end after most of the alcohol is depleted, that's the tails. 
and that's not good. You get soapy flavors, greasy flavors, off flavors. So it's very important in distillation, whether it's batch or continuous distillation like we do, to have everything balanced so that what you're getting off that still from that beer is very clean and it's what the target flavor profile is. So with our still, the way we accomplish this is the beer is fed in up at the uh, 13th plate and we have a, it's a four foot diameter still and it's 45 feet high. And as the beer comes into the top, it cascades back and forth over those plates. You can see those downspouts that are offset as we go down the still. What happens is the beer actually flows down those downspouts and it flows over the plates in between. And each one of those plates has perforations on it. And as the beer is flowing across those plates back and forth down the still, live steam is being fed up from the bottom of the still and it is traveling through those holes and the energy of that steam is boiling or volatilizing the water, the alcohol, and the proper congeners from, uh, from the beer. And as you go up the still, it's becoming more, as the temperature drops, it's becoming more concentrated. Down at the bottom where it's very hot, it's, it's boiling pretty much all the water, all those congeners. But as you go up and that cooler beer is coming down, the temperature drops as you go up the still. As the temperature drops, and we control that, the feed rate and the steam rate to make sure that every, everything is balanced. So that by the time you get to the top of the still, the temperature is right, the flow rate is right, so that we're pulling off just the right congeners. We don't want, we don't want to strip too much out or leave too much in. If we strip too much out and end up at a very high proof, then we're losing some of those flavors that make four roses, four roses. Mm -hmm. If we're going at uh, too low of a, a, a steam velocity and we're letting too much go through, then we're starting to get some of those compounds that we don't necessarily want in there. So it's very important that the still design and the way we run it day in and day out is super balanced and is monitored closely. Next slide, please. So after the distillation, or I should say at the at the top of the still where all those vapors come off, there it all comes off as a vapor. It's still very hot. And the next thing we have to do is bring that back to a liquid. So the way we do that is by dropping the temperature. So that vapor will go through a condenser and it goes into a chamber where there are a lot of um, a lot of pipes with a countercurrent of cold water. That cold water will chill that vapor, force it back into liquid. And at that point, it's at 132 proof, which is great. And it's not bad at that stage, but we still aren't as happy with it as we, we'd like to be. It still has a little bit of a rough characteristic to it, a little bit grainy. And so we, we give it a second distillation in a doubler, or it's, it's designed like a pot still, but it's run much differently than a pot still because it's run continuously. So into the doubler, that first spirit after it's condensed, it goes into the doubler. And then we heat it up again. And that creates, it volatilizes the right congeners, the water and all the alcohol. And it goes out of the top of the doubler as vapor to be condensed again. At this point, it comes off at 140 proof. So really what we're leaving behind here are some of the tails. So some of those compounds that have a higher boiling point than alcohol and water. And these are some of the greasy compounds that I was talking about. So what, what's interesting, though, is those compounds have to go somewhere. So what happens is over time in that doubler, those heavier compounds will start to build up. And if we don't do something about it, even though the temperature doesn't change at all, once the concentration of those rise in that doubler, just by the, the evaporation and the thermodynamics of it, at that concentration, some of those compounds will start to carry over. And so if we don't do anything, if we just ran that continuously after about a week or definitely two weeks, we would start to see some of that greasy character carrying over into the white dog as it came off the doubler. So what we do is once a week, we shut down the still, we shut down the doubler and we will boil out the doubler. We'll crank the temperature way up and boil out all those compounds and just vent them. And then we recharge the doubler with fresh water and start all over again. And you can see here, um, 
these are what we call tail boxes. And that is where after the condenser, that's where the liquid comes out. And I always joke, it, it, you can see it's not really coming out that fast. It's not even as rapid as like a bathtub spigot. But, you know, when you drive onto our property and look around, you see all the buildings and all the people running around. You know, everyone is there doing what they're doing just to keep that little spigot of, of white dog running around the clock. OK, next slide, please. So, you know, I mentioned that back um, in the 50s and 60s, Seagram's had multiple distilleries around the state of Kentucky. And when when each one of these distilleries created their whiskey, they would put it into onto a tanker and send it to one location. It was a central warehousing location located at Cox's Creek, Kentucky. And now that we're the only distillery left of those original five, um, it just so happens that the the aging facility is still the only aging facility we have. So we're basically our legacy is to be stuck with two facilities, which means we have to truck our distillate every day from Lawrenceburg, Kentucky to about 55 miles west to Cox's Creek, Kentucky. So every day we're loading up the tankers with that white dog at around 140 proof and shipping it to the warehousing location. Next slide. Once it arrives there, we will fill the barrels. First, we cut the, the proof. Sorry, we, we cut the proof down to 120 proof. You know, I and mentioned you just, that. You oh, just cut that with water, Brent? Is that how you cut the distillate? Yeah, we cut that with uh, RO water. So it's it's very pure. It's, it has all the minerals, um, any impurities pulled out of it. And you brought up, uh, yeah, reminded me that I forgot to mention that earlier. With the water that we use at the distillery, um, all of our water comes from the Salt River. But um, once we bring it in and clarify it and get all the sediment out, it actually goes into two different streams. One stream is goes into the product. And that stream, we don't do much to. Again, we, we hit it with, um, we, we get the flocculant out or the anything that's uh, solid out of the out of the water. We hit it with a little bit of chlorine to kill any bacteria. And we run it through sand filters just to give it a, a quick cleanup. So it's very nice and clean and pure. But we don't take out any of the minerals because as I mentioned, limestone is part of the reason that Kentucky is so good at making straight bourbon whiskey. Because limestone is calcium carbonate, and that's very good for two reasons. It's good for filtering out any metals, and it's also good because it imparts um, nutrients. That calcium carbonate is actually a nutrient for yeast. So it really helps in the, the fermentation process. Um, but we take another part of that water, and it goes through a separate stream, and it goes through an RO water filtration system also. And from there, it goes to our doubler. I'm, I'm sorry, our boiler. And the reason we do that is we just want to keep the boiler free of any buildup, any scale. And because the water in Kentucky is so hard, if we didn't do that, that would build up in all the pipes and and really gum up the uh, any steam line we have in the plant. And we also have, and this is um, relatively new. Um, you know, I mentioned that everyone is expanding, and we're no exception. We just recently um, finished a huge expansion project where we doubled our capacity in Lawrenceburg. We also were adding warehouses. We added a new bottling facility. There's there's change everywhere you look at Four Roses. Um, but when we scaled up our production process in Lawrenceburg, um, we installed a closed loop chilled water plant, which really helps to reduce our water usage. Um, prior to the plant, what we would do is we would bring the water in from the Salt River and we would use it just like we still do today for fermentation and to create steam, but we would also use it for cooling. And we use water for cooling in the, the cookers, in the yeast tubs, in the fermenters. And cooling is such a big part of our process because we're always heating up. And for efficiency, we need to be able to cool down quickly. So we used a lot of water and we would use that water and put it back into the river. First, we would let it cool down and, and test it and put it back to the river. But now we have a closed a closed loop system where it is filled with the same water and it just goes, it just cycles. And we chill it in the plant, in, in the chill water plant and send it to the distillery to chill and then it goes back. So we've reduced our water usage dramatically 
from that from that perspective with this expansion project. Next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so once the barrels are filled with 120 proof distillate, we put them into our single story rick warehouses. And the single story warehouses, it, I mentioned earlier that temperature is such a driving factor in how a, a barrel ages. And that's the whole reason that we have single story rack warehouses. Uh, back in the early 60s, um, Seagram's kind of got tired of rotating barrels. And the reason people did and some still do rotate barrels in a warehouse is because if you're looking at a multi-tiered warehouse and you're looking at the temperature from the bottom tier to the top tier in the middle of summer, you could see a temperature variation of 30 plus degrees. And if you look at how the uh, temperature affects the aging of a barrel, you can understand that the quality, the color, the flavor, everything is going to be much different from the bottom to the top. One's not necessarily better or worse than the other, but they're going to be different. And so by rotating, maybe taking a few barrels from the bottom and then putting them at the top and vice versa every couple of years, by the end of a barrel's aging cycle or its, its life of aging, the barrels will be more consistent. Um, but Seagram's had the idea to eliminate the need to do that by creating lower warehouses. So ours are much longer and wider than your typical warehouse, but you're only going to see a temperature variation of maybe seven degrees from the bottom to the top. And in that aging, and I'm going to go more into what happens in the barrel later, but you know, it's essentially, as I mentioned, the hot summers and cold winters, the summer forces that liquid in, the winter pulls back out, and you get all these reactions and the extracts taking place. So, of course, you can you can tell immediately that a barrel from, if, if you have two barrels from the same batch and one is much darker, higher in proof than another one, you can pretty much assume that that darker, higher proof bourbon came from a higher tier just because of the temperatures that it was subjected to. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide, please. Um, each one of our warehouses can hold about 24,000 barrels. You can see here, they, if you've been to Kentucky and you've seen a typical warehouse, they don't look much like this. Okay, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, you know, Kentucky climate is good because of the, the change in seasons. When, when it's hot outside, it gets warm in the barrel. The, uh, there's typically head space in the barrel, especially after it ages and you get the, you get some evaporation and you get some soakage of the liquid into the barrel, you'll have some head space. And so what happens is as it, the liquid itself doesn't expand so much, but what it will do is at higher temperatures, more of that liquid will go as vapor into the head space. And that head space, those gases, those will expand with the temperature and push down on the, on the liquid. As that pressure pushes down on the liquid, that forces the liquid into the wood. And the opposite happens when it cools down, the liquid will come out of the wood. So it's almost like it's breathing into and out of the wood with the seasonal changes. So and I mentioned the extraction, that's a big part of it. You have all these compounds, especially in a charred barrel. When you char a barrel, you get a lot of reactions that create a lot of sweet flavors, the, the lactones, the, the, the coconut, the chocolate, all these, all these flavors that are produced through charring in the oak, those are extracted from the, the liquid going into and out of the wood. Uh, another thing that happens in the barrel is that outside layer is charred. And char is basically carbon or activated carbon. And you've probably seen you know, anyone that has a fish tank or has tried to buy a hangover pill that was made of activated carbon. Um, <laughs> activated carbon is <laughs> it's a filtration aid. And I can't vouch for the hangover pills, but <laughs> In theory, they in theory they they probably do pull out some impurities, and I know it works in the fish tank. I've seen that firsthand because um, activated carbon it it draws and it's uh, has absorption properties to pull some of these compounds out. So if you taste white dog, and some of you probably have the, the white dog, sometimes it's kind of harsh, um, has a grainy characteristics. It's it's interesting and it's not always negative. But it's not quite smooth and mellow. It's not like what you'd expect from an aged whiskey. And a lot of those compounds are filtered out by that char that's inside the barrel. Uh, the third thing that happens, and this is also um, a, uh, it's dependent on temperature, it's the chemical reactions. So you get a lot of um, reactions from the original compounds that were in the spirit, um, 
reactions with those those compounds and the compounds in the wood. And you got a lot of um, oxidative reactions to take place too. And all of these reactions, all are very important to creating that mellow, that aged character that, that you get from aging in the barrel. Okay, next slide, please. And the barrel itself is, is pretty interesting. There is, um, there's always been a lot of research going on, but recently um, Independent Stave here in the United States has done a phenomenal job in really exploring how the different um, components of wood affect the aging of straight bourbon whiskey. And if you look at the components that make up wood, this is, um, these are the different proportions. Cellulose is the biggest component. And that's really just the uh, sort of the insoluble backbone of what makes up wood. And it really doesn't have a lot of effect on, on the flavor. It doesn't um, impart any much color or flavor or really filter out any of the flavors. But um, you get over to like hemicellulose, which is another big portion. This creates a lot of different flavors. It gives the toasty characteristics, uh, caramelization products, you get a lot of the color and a lot of the body from the wood sugars. Uh, the lignin, that is, you get a lot of the off notes pulled out from that. That You get a lot of the vanillin, the, the lactones, um, and a lot the rest of the color. Uh, the oak tannins, of course, you get some color. You get um, most of the astringency from the tannins and, um, and again, more of the color. Uh, next slide, please. And here's just an example. This is just a snapshot of a few of the flavors you get out of whiskey and where they come from. Um, some of the important ones here, you know, the vanillin, you see that in pretty much all whiskeys. Um, the lactones which um, cis lactone is very important. That gives the coconut flavor. And that's, cis lactone is always very high in American oak. Um, you have the spicy, the clove character, you know, that comes from the lignin. Uh, the smoky character, that's from the lignin, a direct result of the charring. Um, the fur for all um, comes from the hemicellulose. That's very important. That imparts a lot of the nutty characteristics you find in bourbon. So this is just an example. There are more of these than we could put on in all of these slides, all these different compounds, um, some of which are important to flavor, some not so much, but these are some of the, the key components that come from the oak that really impart that, that color and that flavor that you find in aged bourbon. Um, I know it's, not, it's impossible to really scientifically gauge how much flavor comes from the barrel, but it's pretty much, you know, the, the industry has pretty much landed on 66% or two thirds the flavor that you get from whiskey comes from the barrel. But as I mentioned earlier, I think what really makes the difference from one whiskey to the next um, or one producer from the next is how everything is treated on the front end because most everyone in the, yes, we all use American oak. We do have different specifications on the level of char. Mm -hmm. And of course, everything's aged in different warehouses for different amounts of time. but Really, and especially for us, the best way to drive the final flavor is on the front end, and that's with the yeast, the fermentation, the mash bills that we use. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so you all probably um, heard a lot about chill filtration, and um, if you paid attention to our recent release, the Small Batch Select, that is our first um, permanent addition to our lineup and that is non-chill filtered and chill filtering is really something that most all distillers have been doing for years and the reason for it is through the production either from compounds in the grain or probably more importantly compounds in the wood a lot of these compounds they end up in the liquid so they're in the barrel the whole time it's aging and they're all in solution you can't see them they they don't precipitate out and there's a reason for that. These compounds are very soluble in ethanol or in alcohol. So at 120 proof, for example, in our barrels, these compounds are fine. They, they stay in, in solution. But if we take one of our barrels out of the warehouse, we cut it down to, let's say, 80 proof and put it in a bottle. Um, within days, that will start to get cloudy. It will start to haze up. And eventually, it will, be, it will almost look like there's dissolved tissue paper in that liquid. 
And that's because all those compounds, um, and one, one of the big compounds, one of the most important compounds that we actually monitor in the chill filtration is called beta-cetosterol. And it's essentially the plant's version of cholesterol. It's a big fatty molecule that is soluble in ethanol, but not so much water. And there are also other fatty acid and ethyl esters and all these other um, compounds that help build these complexes that, that create that haze. But all of these compounds, once you start adding water, like cutting it down to 80 proof, they're not in solution anymore. They want to come out. So they'll find each other. They'll start to build bigger clumps until at first it's cloudy. And then eventually you actually have flock or you have what looks like solid pieces suspended or sitting on the bottom of the bottle. So um, we understand that a lot of people wouldn't um, appreciate that. I'm sure a lot of you wouldn't care because you know what it is. And I certainly don't care, but if, on a shelf, if one of our 80 proof bottles was cloudy, people probably wouldn't, they'd probably be turned off by it. And at a hundred proof, you're kind of on the fence. Sometimes the uh, the bottle will be stable, other times not. It kind of depends on the barrel and the concent original concentration of those compounds. But um, to be safe and to to create stable bourbon, what we do and what is done pretty much industry wide for lower proof bourbons is we force that precipitation um, through liquid processing. And what that means is before we bottle, we'll dump all of the bourbon. It'll be in a tank and we'll cut it to just above bottling proof. So, for example, if it's going to be small batch, we'll cut it to like 90.5 proof and then we'll chill it down. We'll chill it down as quickly as we can and force that precipitation. Once some of those precipitates come out of solution and they don't all come out, especially at 90 proof, we probably we got a good portion of them, but not all of them. Um, at 100 proof, we don't even get out half of them. But what's important is we're getting enough out that once we filter it and pull those out it's going to be stable because if it if it weren't going to be stable at that temperature in the first place then those compounds would have come out before they were filtered if that makes sense so at, after the filtration it's stable it's uh ready for the shelf we'll put it in the bottle and again it's it's processed you know anything for under 100 proof for a private barrel program we don't do any chill filtration. It's all non-chill filtered and barrel strength. For our limited editions, the same thing. And for our um, small batch select, that's cut to 104 proof. It's not chill filtered. But we know that at 104 proof, it's going to be stable. Okay, next question or next slide. <laughs> okay, so... Um, I know this has been really, I've been focusing a lot on the science behind it, but I want to stress again, just how unique our process is at Four Roses. And it all begins with premium quality grains. And I didn't mention this either, but we are, um, we're proud that we use all non-GMO grains. Um, of the grains we use, corn is really the only one that's commercially genetically modified. But um, fortunately for us, you know, I mentioned that for years, our big markets were Japan and Europe. And the uh, the attention to genetically modified grains um, in Europe and Japan has been, they've been much more sensitive to it than in the U S in the past. So because those were our big markets, we were always producing or making sure that all of the corn that we received was non GMO. Um, it's fortunate for us now because now in the U S everyone seems to really pay more attention to what they're consuming. And they really care about um, the fact that something is, or is not genetically modified. So, we're happy to say that all of our grains are non-GMO. Um, of course, we use hard limestone water from the Salt River. We have the single-story rick warehouses to create a nice, even maturation. And for that, us, that's important, too. Now, many producers use the multi-tiered warehouses, or most all use multi-tiered warehouses. And that's actually, they use it to their advantage. It is a great thing because the benefit to multi-tiered warehouses is with those temperature variations, you can actually have different characteristics from different sections of different warehouses. And so you can use that to your advantage by creating different labels with different flavor characteristics from different locations on the property, different warehouses. Um, for us though, because we have the 10 recipes and we want to use those 10 recipes to control the ultimate flavor of the whiskey, we like the single story warehouses. We don't want that extra dimension of that extra variable 
to have to contend with. We want our, our whiskeys to come out um, consistent from the sixth tier down to the first tier so that we can take them and use them in our different products. And I also didn't mention the reason we had the 10 recipes really is for consistency. Uh, you saw that in the, the uh, guidelines for being straight bourbon whiskey, we can't adulterate the flavor in any way whatsoever. And I think that's fantastic. I think that's part of the appeal of, of whisk of bourbon is that it's, it brings the art into it. There's you, we're at the mercy of, of temperature, the grains, um, you know, mother nature. There, there's so much that's out of our control that has a big effect on the ultimate flavor of bourbon whiskey. And that's where no matter how much science we employ, there's always going to be a degree of art. There's always going to be that attention to detail, the human taste, the human nose, you know, checking these these batches, blending them. There's always going to be that art that goes into making straight bourbon whiskey. Um, but no matter how we try, we can't make every single barrel or every single batch exactly the same because of these variables. But we do want our products to be consistent um, from batch to batch or year to year. And so that's how we can we can control that ultimate flavor profile is by utilizing different proportions of these different recipes for each of our products. But for each one of our products, we do have a different combination of these that we use. So um, each one of our products is different on a very fundamental level from the next because of the yeast strains and the, the mash bills that are used in each one of those. Next slide, please. So, hey Brent, before yeah. before we get into to the bourbons, um, I know you touched a little bit on the water, uh, the rejection of our water usage. What uh, what happens when um, what happens to the rest of the grain once the liquid is removed from that? What happens? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I talked a lot about what's coming off the top of the still. You know, that's where all the vapor and all the important product comes off that's going to be condensed and used for bourbon, but at the bottom of the still, we have even more, more matter coming off, a lot of water, all of those grains. So there's a large flow of a, a mass coming off the bottom of the still constantly. Uh, what we do with that is first we separate that into thin and thick stillage. And the thin stillage is actually used, it's brought back into the process. And I should have mentioned this. I'm glad you're, you brought this up for two reasons now. Um, when we set a fermenter, and we start the fermentation process, we um, we sour mash it. And basically what that means is we adjust the pH. We, we get the pH down to where it's acidic or sour. And the way we do that is by adding that back set, that liquid that comes off the base of the still. It's been through fermentation. And through fermentation, you get a lot of acids that are created. It gets very sour. So we'll take a portion of that, just the right amount, and add it back. And it could be anywhere from... 10, 15 to 25 or so percent of the, the total fermenter volume. It just depends on what the pHs are of the, the um, fermenter and the back set. But we control that so we hit a target pH. And what we do, the reason we do that is bacteria doesn't like to grow in an acidic environment. With our open fermenters, like you saw, there's plenty of bacteria in the air. Um, if you take a tour with me, I'll invite you to put your finger in there and taste it. But that's okay because it's so acidic that any bacteria in the air on your finger is not going to grow and spoil that 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 fermenting mash. Um, but the rest of that liquid that comes off the back uh, back end of the um, of the still, we take that and it ends up going to one of two places. Ultimately, it all ends up being fed to to animals. Um, but we'll take it and either give to farmers basically as is and we just call that slop it just will farmers line up every morning and will load up their tanks full of that and they'll take to their farms and feed their animals or we'll dry it down and into distillers dried grain and then we sell that it's just a little bit higher in protein um it's more compact it's dry so it's easier to transport um but all that the the ability to make distillers dried grain that's something new to us too with our um expansion we brought dryers back into the plant. We brought back um, all of the infrastructure that it takes to create that distiller's dried grain. So from all the grains that come in, the water, there's really no waste there. But um, That's all. you want to go? I'm sorry? You want to go into the pro I mean, I didn't, I didn't have any other questions about that. Okay. Um, 
Well, I should mention too that even our barrels, and we go through a lot of wood, but the barrels that we use, you know, I mentioned we can only use them one time and we go through a lot of barrels. But fortunately for us, there's a big market for used barrels. Uh, Scotch whiskey, they don't they don't want new barrels. Um, you're all familiar with Scotch whiskey. If you put Scotch whiskey in a new barrel, it would get a lot of the sweetness, a lot of the dark color. It'd probably be some it'd be a hybrid between bourbon and Scotch whiskey. Um, what they use the barrels for, it's more just like an inert aging container where it just mellows in the cool temperatures over in Scotland. Um, so a lot of our barrels, after they're used one time, go to Scotland where they reuse them. They reuse them until they just fall apart and can't be salvaged anymore. And then um, more recently, a lot of breweries here in the U.S. and everywhere are using second use barrels for, for aging beer. So that's also you know, a stream where we're not creating any waste. Yeah. I believe we have a uh, one coming out soon, correct? Uh, a partnership that we have? Yes, we do. Uh, Brooklyn Brewery is releasing a their Black Ops. This is the second year that uh, we've partnered with them where they take their uh, Russian Imperial Stout and they age it in four rows of small batch barrels. So we're excited about that. That'll be out soon. Yeah. So I see Lindsay's joined us. Do you have some questions for us, Lindsay? Oh my goodness. We have a bunch of questions. Our, our friends have been watching intently and I'm going to be honest, most of the comments have been about how much we all love you, Brent, and how much we appreciate you, Jill. So bear with me. I'm going to go through these questions one by one. Okay. okay. Uh, so first, what is your take on Missouri bourbon? And is there a possibility Four Roses would have a future distillery there to tap that market? Um, I'm sure Missouri makes great bourbon. I haven't tried any yet though. Um, I don't know. I think if we, if we expanded again, it might be a while because with our recent expansion, we've doubled our capacity. You know, who knows how much bourbon we're going to sell in the next five to 10 years, but we should be okay for a while before we have to expand again. So you never know. I would expect if we expanded, we'd probably do it on site. Um, and really with this expansion project, um, we looked at different ways to expand because we knew we had to do it. But we also looked at the uh, implications it could have on the quality of our whiskey. And when we looked at everything, we realized the only way we could do that without potentially upsetting, because I mentioned so much of that is art that you know some that we understand, some that we don't. We realized that we had to do it from the same water source, under the same here, roof. Yeah. We did it all. And it was much more expensive to do it that way and it took a lot longer but we're glad we did it that way because we we could have done it cheaper and done it off site and then five years down the road when the first whiskey comes off the still that we'd be using realize it's different we'd it'd be too late yeah so. i hear you i mean i'm gonna tell you right now as a kentucky and i appreciate that you are not just down the road so <laughs> love hearing that <laughs> fantastic all right so somebody was asking about um the fermenters why not switch to steel for ease of use and then double wall it like a yeti cooler that's a creative solution mm -hmm. yeah and and that's done a lot um you know anytime people are working with liquids jacketed tanks they're very efficient they're they work very well um for us there are a few good reasons why we wouldn't go to stainless um one is if you come and visit and you look inside our historic building where all the wooden fermenters are, you'll notice that the main room is all wood. And in the addition, there's there's an addition that was put on at some point that isn't under the same roof and there's stainless steel fermenters there. And there's another room that's more of a permanent room and those are all wooden fermenters. And if you look at the roof and you look at the walls, it's, it's impossible to get stainless steel fermenters in there. Um, we'd have to take the roof off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that middle section, sort of that room between the two or that space between the two rooms, when that was put on, they put stainless steel fermenters in there. And I couldn't even tell you what year that was, but those will last forever. So that is the benefit of stainless. The wood wears out. And and this is something else interesting. So we always have had that ratio of wood to stainless before the expansion. With this new expansion, we actually kept the same ratio. So we bought some new wood and some stainless steel. And the stainless will be in there forever because um, you can't get them out, can't put them back in. The wood, the good thing is when they wear out, we can open up a window and take them in one board at a time and reassemble them inside the distillery. Yeah. 
That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. All right. So we've got more questions. Do you make your own barrels? Do you have coopers on site or where do you get your barrels made? Uh, we get ours from Kentucky Cooperage, which is part of Independent Stave. And well, this is the barrels come from Missouri. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. It all comes right back. I should have clicked, I should have clicked the last time. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. I love it. Um, is the warehousing organized by yeast strain? No, it's not. Um, any particular warehouse has a blend of different years, different recipes. It's what we actually do is when we're producing, we'll we'll in, enter all the new um, barrels into one warehouse one month and then move to the next warehouse. So we rotate. And that's really um, just in case. You know, there's ever a fire or, you know, something that happens to a particular warehouse, we're not wiped out for like an entire year. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be, you know, one month for every, you know, 22 months. So we'll just, it wouldn't be, I mean, it'd be devastating, but it wouldn't really shut down the flow of our production. It wouldn't put a gap of like a, a year's production in our inventory. There is a reason you are Master Distiller of the Year, my friend. <laughs> uh, the next question is, uh, Jill, this might be more uh, your territory here. Um, how does one get into the Mellow Moments Club so we can keep <laughs> up with Four Roses and all of the bourbon news? Um, actually, you can go to mellowmomentsclub.com. We, we um, do limit our... Um, membership uh, based on uh, being able to provide a, a more personal experience to our members and our fans. So it does open up um, every quarter, first day of every quarter, and it usually opens up in the morning. So if you just keep hitting refresh, and then um, occasionally we do give out referrals for some of our events as well. So you'll just have to uh, have to keep up. And then um, we also have a straight up newsletter, which you can sign up um, on our website, which um, also gives you um, up to date events and news. Awesome. That sounds like a very good place to go. Uh, all right. So somebody, th this next question is a big one. All right. There are a lot, okay. lot there's a lot here. Um, they would like to return to the first slide. So Leo, if you could hop us back to that first slide, it stated that there are 7.5 million barrels of bourbon aging in Kentucky with an annual federal payroll of 800 million. However, the Kentucky Distillers Association has the two, 2020 numbers at 9.3 million barrels of bourbon currently aging and a payroll topping 1 billion. Um, are those numbers old or are, Jared, oh my goodness, that's so many words. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew it was you before I knew it was you. Um, I'm so proud of you always. Uh, but uh, are the, is that 9.3 or is the, the 7.5 more up to date? We, These yeah. are actually more, what he put up is more up to date. I didn't realize they'd release the oh uh, revised numbers. These They're numbers are nuts. Either way, those numbers now, are yeah. incredible. They're, that's so cool to see. I thought right. those were big numbers. Yeah, we'll have to revise that. It, it's yeah. wrong that quickly. That, that's yeah. so cool. I, again, as a Kentuckian, thank you. <laughs> you guys are doing so much. All right. So next question, the dry grain, does it contain more protein or does it contain more vitamins, minerals, the dried grain? How does it, how does it benefit the animals? Excess protein only? Um, it is. So it's devoid mostly of the carbohydrates because the, the starch has been broken up. There is a little residual starch uh, that the animals can break down. So they might get some residual um, carbohydrates, but it's a lot of protein. Uh, the minerals and vitamins, um, it's probably by percentage, it's a smaller proportion, but it's still a significant amount because I guess, you know, and I'm no dietitian for animals, but I know that it's, or, or people, I don't know, you know, when you say you need so much vitamin C a day, you know, I know it's just a few milligrams and I couldn't tell you, you know, how much of, you know, the daily recommended allowance, some grain will give a cow, but it's, <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's significant because it's it's all natural grain. And some of those like those minerals, those heavy like uh, compounds that I know make up vitamins, those all remain in that liquid. And even when we're um, when we dry it down to sell it to to farmers, a lot of that, a lot of those soluble vi vitamins that might have been in the mash and in the liquid, when we dry that out, we actually recapture that and concentrate into a syrup 
and we reapply it to the dried grains. Um, so we try to capture still all those nutrients and make sure that they're reintroduced to the grain before they go out the, the door for feed. Awesome. So, but honestly, I, I couldn't tell you like sure. the amount um, or the percentage of the proportions, but it's, you know, significant pr protein and, you know, it's a beneficial amount of vitamins. Well, we can look around here and see just how healthy all these animals are. When you drive out to the distillery, you can just see how happy they are out in the field. So you're doing something good. <laughs> uh, excellent. All right. The next question is a little bit personal. How did you get into distilling? Um, that's a good question. I didn't really, you know, when I was studying chemistry and growing up in Kentucky, I always knew about bourbon, but I never really thought about getting into the industry. I guess it was one of those things that was probably didn't even occur to me because it's too good to be true. You know, I didn't think, you know, they just let people come in and distill bourbon for one of these major distilleries. Um, so I really was, was lucky in how I got into it. I was, um, I grew up in Kentucky. I went to school at the university of Kentucky, but I was living in Tennessee and I'd been down there about seven years and I had just got married, had just bought a house and we were ready to start our lives. And I came up for a, a visit back home and I took a tour of Woodford reserve. And something clicked when I was taking the tour. I was like, you know, I bet you know, I know science and I know bourbon. And I know there's got to be some science behind this bourbon. They've <laughs> got to employ chemists or biologists or, or someone to be working behind the scenes. And um, that was on a Saturday. That very next day, I got back to Nashville and I found a posting. Now, I wasn't really familiar with what Four Roses was at the time because it wasn't in the U.S. then. Or it had just recently come back and it surely wasn't Tennessee. It was only in Kentucky at the time. Um, but it was like a, a, an assistant manager for the laboratory. And basically it was, you know, at the time there were probably know, maybe 10 people in administration in Lawrenceburg. Um, That's amazing. There was one person in sales and marketing, one other person in the quality department, um, Al Young, the plant manager, uh, John Ray, the, uh, plant or the officer, uh, Jim Rutledge, the master distiller one person in human resources and that's about it. I and mean, there, we had very few people there. So I, I started basically just to start up the laboratory and um, work from that side. But because we were so small, I kind of pitched in. I had a lot of opportunity to help where help was needed everywhere in production in inventory management, even in like promotions and, and marketing events. Um, I remember back, what year did you start Jill? Oh, eight. Oh, wait. And she started not, I started in 05. She started in 08. And I remember even when she started, like we weren't much outside of Kentucky and we would just five go, eight. yeah, we were in five States and our idea of promotions would be like us. I'd take my wife. It was, you know, before we had kids, we, we all just be like, yeah, see ya at the charity event. We just drive and go set up a table and talk to people about four roses. And just cause we all, you know, it means a lot to us. You know, we, we kind of were there from the beginning of it, you know, really starting to get the momentum in the, in the U S. And so, yeah, I did everything from, you know, the behind the scenes lab production to doing promotions. And as you know, you know, the modern distiller master distiller, it, a lot of it is promotions now, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of got practice with that while I was getting practice with everything else. So everything just kind of fell into place for me in that sense. And I just kind of grew with the company. I love that. That's so cool. Oh my goodness. All right. We've got two more. One, you mentioned Kentucky produces 95% of the world's bourbon and the bourbon boom. When was the last time there was so much bourbon being produced? Somebody is reading the quiz question. <laughs> <laughs> She's smart. <laughs> Uh-oh. I think that was in slide one, wasn't it, Jill? It was. Well, okay, so cheat. that's a maybe a rewind situation. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, so during fermentation in the fermentation room, are all of the mash bills with their yeast strain recipes present, or only one recipe is present during fermentation? Um, usually, there's in in the process, and we have each batch is eight fermenters, and we typically have either. 24 fermenters going at once or 36. Um, I'm sorry. 38. <laughs> so, but we have, so we have um, 
at most two different recipes going at the same time. So there could be two firmware side by side where one is V yeast and one is K yeast. But then all of those like to this side of the room are going to be that yeast and to this side are going to be the other yeast. Mm -hmm. um, so, but at most, we hardly ever have, if ever, three different yeast strains fermenting in the three rooms at the same time. Very cool. Well, that I think wraps up all the questions that we have from all of our friends watching from around the country and around the world. Um, is there anything that the two of you want to, to, to share and add? I, I'm going to just thank everybody for coming if you're all done. No, we just uh, look forward to the to the next 25 who uh, fill out their survey and get to, to participate with us in December. Very cool. Well, thanks to everyone for tuning in today. I cannot believe, well, I can believe because we're talking about Four Roses. I cannot believe how many of you showed up and were hanging out with us today. So thank you so much for being a part of the stream. Those questions and that participation make these so much more fun for all of us and hopefully for all of you too. Um, just so you know, on Monday, we will be back at 2 p.m. Eastern. So make sure you tune in on our Very Marvelous Monday with Tanya Clark, who's talking about meditation and moderation the exact opposite of what we talked about today. Got to have both. It's very important to have balance in life. Um, and we want to make sure that you know, um, if you haven't, if you don't want to sign into Facebook, we are always streaming these classes live on YouTube as well. Um, you can go over to YouTube um, and check out Portland Cocktail Week or just go to this link here, pdxcw.com slash YouTube. And make sure that you like the Portland Cocktail Week and Camp Run Amok pages because that's where all of our info comes out. That's how you find out about great classes like this and you get a little time with Brent and Jill. Thank you both so much for being here today. And I wanna remind every one of you, those quizzes are in the comments. So make sure you go to pdxcw.com slash four roses. I peaked and last I checked, there were only eight spots left for hoodies. So you better mm -hmm. hustle. Uh, we are running out fast, but you've got a little bit of time if you wanna take your time on the quiz, no sweat. That's totally fine too, because 25 of you are gonna get really great little prize packs that I will be packing up here tomorrow. So keep an eye on my Instagram. I might, might give you a little sneak peek of what we're doing there too. Thank you both so much for all of your time today. This was so interesting and so informative. And you know, we miss we miss being able to come visit you at camp uh, while, while we're going through this pandemic. So this this warmed our hearts a whole lot today to get to to get to see both of you and get to hear all about Four Roses today. So thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you.